in our lives, God. this time let's just take this time to just worship of course to praise him but also to worship in spirit and in truth oh we celebrate we praise you for all the good things you've done through all the seasons
just feel that there are some of you um, who thinks that wherever you are right now, where, wherever your situation, that it's impossible for God to reach you. It's impossible for God to come in to that cave or that hiding place where you're hiding. But this morning, I just want to declare and I just want to tell you that God, this God that we believe in, this God that we worship is the God of the impossible. And He is love. And when He died on that cross, He died for you and I. He died for our sin, died for our shame. And that this morning, wherever you are, whether it's, you think it's too dark, but you think it's too high for Him to reach or too deep uh, into your situation for Him to, to come and reach, you know, this morning, I just want to sing this over you. There's no place to a dark, there's no high to high, there's no
God, this morning we just want to thank you, God, for the victories, God. We thank you, God, for the breakthroughs. We thank you, God, that you, you come and meet us where we are, God. That you come, God, and you rescue us, God. That, Lord, in our situations or in our circumstance, God, you are faithful through it all. Now, just like the, the 99 sheep, the one sheep that's lost and the 99 sheep that's found, God, you came and you rescued that one sheep. And Lord, this morning, God, we open the, the, the doors of our hearts, God, and we welcome you. We ask that, God, that you come, Lord, and do what you only you can do in our lives, God. We thank you, God, for the cross. We thank you, God, that through you we are more than conquerors, God. That through you, God, we can overcome, God. And we just want to claim, we just want to claim that over our lives. We just want to claim that over our situations, God. We just want to claim that over our circumstance, God. And we praise you because you have been faithful through generations, God, and you are faithful today. And that you are a good, good God. We give you all the glory, God. We give you all the praise and the honor, God. In Jesus' name, all God's people say, Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for joining our live stream today. Now this morning we have none other than Evan Paul who will be bringing the word. Now a little bit about Evan, if you don't already know, he is leading the youth zone in Cornerstone Miri together with Jedida. And usually on the weekly basis, he'll be behind the cameras, editing or filming, but today he'll be in front of it. Now, without further ado, Evan, over to you. Good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for tuning in once again. It's such a great honor to be bringing you the word today. It certainly has been quite a while. As you can tell, uh, I have locked down hair. So, you know, and I simply didn't have the guts to try to cut it myself or let someone else do it. So, uh, there's a lot going on here. So, please bear with me. Uh, for the time being, okay? Now, in the past two months, we've looked at um, Revelation and uh, we've looked at the seven letters to the seven churches. And I hope that you've been blessed by that series. But today, we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're going to talk about something else, all right? We're going to talk about something new. Now, as I prepared uh, this message for this weekend, you know, I, feel, I felt uh, particularly inclined to talk about one uh, topic, and that is failure. All right. <laughs> yes, you heard me right. I will be talking about failure today. and I have entitled my message, God Over My Failures. Now, I know it sounds a little bit like a, like a downer, doesn't it? Right? It sounds uh, like, like a little bit morbid, but I assure you that I'm not a downer. Um, I'm not a sadist. I'm not here to discourage you, but in fact, you know, um, I believe if we learn to look at this uh, topic uh, in God's eyes maturely, that there is something for us to learn here through failure. Now, I'm convinced that God sees failure, this particular word that we, we may, you know, think of as a very dirty word or very unpleasant word, uh, that He sees failure differently. And I hope by the end of this, I will have been able to convince you that uh, to change the way you look at failure and the way you cope and deal with it in your lives. A common saying is that, you know, uh, failure isn't an option, right? Uh, especially when you watch movies, right? The action movies, especially the ones in the 90s. You know, the, the main character, the hero will stare on the screen and say, failure isn't an option. Now, I say no to that. In fact, I, I say that sometimes failure is the only option. You see, that's the truth, right? Like it or not, some failure is expected in our lives. We have to go through it. Like it or not, sooner or later, we all have to deal with this, right? Even if you follow God, sometimes you fail. Sometimes you make mistakes. Like, just look at the Bible, right? Look at all the biblical heroes that we look up to, um, examine their lives and you will see that everywhere, every one of them, they experience failure too. Nobody is exempt from failure, even when you're following God. 
Now, they, remember, they were every bit as human as we are. This uh, Bible heroes, right? And they are prone to making mistakes. They are prone to failing at what they do sometimes. King David, right? The supposed man after God's own heart, right? We, ex- we know that he experienced some really rough patches in his life. He committed murder and adultery. Peter, who, you know, is supposedly, pro- uh, you know, one of the uh, people in the New Testament with the biggest ministry, right? He famously denounced Christ three times. Abraham put his wife in danger, you know, when, when, uh, in terrible danger when he acted out of fear and, and refused to tell the truth. The great apostle Paul spent a lot, a huge chunk of his life being on the wrong side, you know, being against God and, and persecuting God's people. They all made mistakes that were seemingly very big and affected their lives. And yet they are still our Bible heroes. God looks at failure differently. And today we're going to look, we're going to examine one person's life uh, and, and learn a few lessons through the failures and the mistakes in his life that he encountered. And that's Moses, right? Today we're going to look at Moses' life. Uh, and we're going to zoom in into tr- three main events, right? Today we're just going to look at three events and we're going to try to draw three lessons from the life in Moses in failures. Amen? Are you guys ready? All right. Now, a little bit of backstory. I know everyone must be familiar with who uh, Moses is. He is, after all, one of the greatest prophets to ever live, right? Um, we know Moses as the deliverer of Israel, the one who God raised up uh, and sent to, to deliver Israel when they were captive in Egypt as slaves. Now, his story begins in Exodus all the way uh, to Deuteronomy. He, he was the one who God raised up uh, to deliver uh, Israel and lead them out of Egypt and into uh, and begin the journey into the promised land. Now the Lord is recorded uh, of, of Moses' early life, uh, except that we know that you know, uh, Moses was, was basically born in a time when, when uh, the, the male children of the Israelites were being murdered, right? were not allowed to live. And he was hidden um, by Pharaoh's daughter, uh, uh, and he was able to live. And he was only able to live because of God's grace upon his life and the mercy that, that uh, was shown him by Pharaoh's daughter. Now, we're going to fast forward a little bit and into the first event, all right? We're going to look at the first event, uh, the f- I will call it a failure event in his life, um, and we're going to try to learn something from here. And that's number one, uh, the murder in Egypt. I'm going to read from Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 to 15. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them uh, at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Now, uh, remember, you know, Israel were, were slaves in Egypt and, and uh, Moses uh, one day when he was as an adult, right, he came out and, and he saw that his people were being bullied and, and being beaten by an Egyptian. Verse 12, it says, Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. So this is the first event uh, that we're going to look at and how it changed Moses' life. You see, Moses, Moses saw that um, you know, his people were, were was being beaten by an Egyptian, being, being uh, uh, tormented or, or tortured. And and out of his zeal and anger, he fought back and, and he fought for, for him and he murdered an Egyptian. Now, his failure in this part is, you know, his failure to control his own anger and zeal, right? Uh, to the point that he committed murder. And then later on, uh, he had to flee. He had to run from his home. You see, this act, this event drastically changed his life from this point on. Up to this point, he'd, he'd been living, uh, 
you know, under Pharaoh's daughter's house, right? Um, and this act had tremendous effects on his life, not just physically, right? Physically because he had, to, he had to run for his life, he had to flee. But I also believe it affected him and changed his life emotionally as well. Try to put, your shoe, try to put yourself in the shoes of Moses just for a while, right? Remember, you know, when we, when we read about the Bibles, uh, when we read about the heroes of the Bible, sometimes we tend to, tend to dehumanize them, right? Because we're reading about them as heroes you know, superheroes or, 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 you know, uh, otherworldly beings. But that's not the truth, right? We forget that these people are every bit as human as we are. They feel fear. They experience shame. They feel guilt just as we do. They, they struggle with low self-esteem just as we do, right? All these things, um, they experience as well. And if you think about it, this must have been an incredibly traumatic experience for Moses, right? He just murdered someone with his own hands and now he had to flee for his life, you know, and, and, and he had to leave his mother as well, right? He had to leave uh, Egypt and, and, and hide in Midian, right? This must have been a life-changing, traumatic experience for him. And we later on know that you know, Moses lived in, in Midian for many years before uh, God eventually appeared to him at the burning bush, right, and called him to go and lead his people out of Egypt again. Now, we're going to look, we're going to fast forward a little bit in, into that, that part where God finally appears to him at the burning bush and, and calls him. And you know the story, right? They go back and forth. God tells him, you know, I want you to go and lead my people out of Egypt, right? And what happens then, of course, um, did, did Moses accept the call just like that? No, right? We, we, we know the story, right? He, uh, he was reluctant at first. And um, we're going to look at that, right? The first time God tells him, uh, God appears to him and tells him to do this, what was his reply? Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? You know, this is his first response, right? Who am I? And what do you sense there? There is, there is a feeling of unworthiness. There is a feeling of, uh, of a lack of confidence. There is a reluctance to do what he's been called to do. They then go back and forth again. And, and uh, Moses asks a ton of questions about, you know, what would I say if I go there? Even if I did go there, you know, what do you want me to say to them? How would they believe me? And all these things. And Exodus chapter 4, uh, verse 1 uh, Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? Again, God goes back and forth with Moses, convincing him and telling him what to do. Uh, and, and God says, you know, uh, take the staff and then it will turn into uh, a snake. And, and then when you take the, snake, the tail of the snake, it will become a staff again, so telling him that, you know, uh, this will be a sign and, and all that. And then Moses said to the Lord in chapter 4, verse 11, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been uh, eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Uh, verse 11. And that's where we get the idea that Moses uh, perhaps was a stutterer, right? Uh, and he had a speech impediment. So, again, you know, we see Moses trying to make an excuse here and say that, you know, I can't speak, you know, I, I can't do this, right? And then again, in uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 13, Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else, right? Right here, at least four times, at least four times we see uh, Moses being reluctant, being fearful, being possibly of very low self-esteem and trying to evade the responsibility uh, of, of what God was telling him to do. And how many of us are familiar with that, right? Now, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly why, you know, uh, Moses felt like that or, or why he stuttered and things like that. But can I suggest to you uh, that perhaps it really could be related to the trauma he experienced in his past. I can imagine, I can just imagine him at that point saying, I'm not good enough for this task. 
You know, his self-confidence must have, com have been completely demolished by the failures of his past when he murdered an Egyptian and had to flee for his life. You know, I can imagine him thinking, look what happened the last time when I cared about something, when I cared about my people in Egypt, and, and look what happened then. I became a murderer and had to flee for my life. I can imagine him being, being haunted by the trauma of his past and saying to himself, no, I, I, I really can't do this, right? Who am I? That's why his first response was, who am I to be able to do this? And this is where we get our first lesson for today uh, out of the first incident, right? Lesson one is this, we are not defined by our failures. Amen? Now, Yes, Moses was reluctant at first, right? But eventually we know the story. Eventually he goes back and forth with God, but eventually he comes around and he accepts the call that God has upon his life. And God even, you know, allowed him to bring Aaron with him to, to help him, right? You see, that's the thing. God still chose him, right? At that point when God chose to speak to him at the burning bush, it's not like God didn't know uh, what had happened in the past in, in Moses' life. It's not like God didn't know the, the weaknesses and, and shortcomings that he had, right? But God still chose him. God still wanted to use him. God still, still wanted to use him as, as, as the deliverer of Israel out of Egypt. See, some of us may have encountered failure in our lives. You know, uh, we made a huge mistake at some point. And because of that, we have sworn off something and we said, you know, never again, never again am I doing this, right? But you see, like I said at the start of this, God doesn't see failure the way you see it, right? We mustn't let our past failures stop us from saying yes to God. Now, you know, you can wrestle with Him, you can debate with Him, you can pour out, you know, your reluctance to do it. Do what you need to do but don't let it stop you from moving forward. Allow God to speak to you, to convince you and to define you rather than to let your past failures define what you can or cannot do. You know, at the end, we know, right, that, that God eventually convinced Moses and, and as Moses learned to just trust God and step into it, he became the leader that he needed to be. And, and, and that's our first lesson, right? We are not defined by, the, by our failures, right? God is the one who defines us and he doesn't look uh, and, and he doesn't define us by our failures. Right, eventually we know that Moses gives in to God, he accepts his call and a lot of things happen, right? He went to Egypt uh, and with, with Aaron, they performed miracles, they talked to the Israelites, they talked to Pharaoh, uh, he, they unleashed the, the plagues upon Egypt and eventually they got out of Egypt, right? They began the the exodus out of Egypt. Now, this is where Moses uh, slowly uh, be becomes established as the leader of Israel, right? God begins to speak to him and to give him the commandments. Now, at this point, Moses has gone through a major uh, a character transformation from who, who he was to the leader that God uh, wanted him to be. Yet at this point now, now he, he, has, he has changed a lot, right? You know, things have been going good for him and, and they just witnessed so many miracles. And yet at this point, something still goes wrong, all right? So let's look at the second event. And that is the event of the golden calf. How many of you are familiar with that story, right? They are out in the wilderness. You know, Moses is, is meeting with God uh, on the mountain. And that's where he was receiving the commandments from God. God is telling him how, what to do and, and, and how to lead the people, what they should do. And as God is on the mountain with, with uh, sorry, as Moses was on the mountain with God and, and receiving all this, uh, what happens? The people got impatient of waiting. Remember, the people couldn't go up the mountain with Moses, right? Only Moses was allowed to go. Um, and the people got impatient. And what happened? They asked Aaron to create a golden calf for them uh, as an idol for worship. Let's go to Exodus uh, chapter 32, verse 7. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. 
They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and that I may consume them. And I will make you... uh, of, I will make of you a great nation. And this brings us to lesson number two, is that we, we have to deal with all kinds of failures, including the failures of others. You know, take note, take note here, right? At this point, in this particular event, Moses didn't actually do anything wrong. He did everything correctly. He did what he could and should. He was, he was listening and he was with God listening and, and receiving the commandments. You know, when he went up the mountain, guess who he left in charge? Aaron, right? He left Aaron in charge. And, and, you know, Aaron was the one who was supposed to take care of things when Moses wasn't around. Now, guess who was the one who actually made the golden calf and proclaimed a feast and, and, and led the people to worship the, the golden calf? It was Aaron, Think about this for a moment and about how Moses must have felt uh, when, when he found out about this. You see, he was, the, the Bible tells us he was so angry, right, that he, he came down from the mountain with the, with the two tablets that he broke it, right? He was so consumed by anger that he broke it. Now, think about this. Aaron was Moses' right-hand man. If there was anybody in the whole of Israel that Moses trusted more than anyone, it must have been Aaron, right? Because this is the same Aaron who went with him to perform the miracles. This is the same Aaron who went with him to deliver Israel out of Egypt. He should have known better, right? And yet this is the, this, and yet Aaron caved into the request of the people at that point of time and, and, and led them to idol worship. See, in our lives, sometimes, like in this particular story, we are Moses. We did everything right. You know, we did what we could. We did what we should. And yet, things still don't go our way. We still fail because of other people, right? Sometimes, in this particular story, we are Aaron. You know, we should have known better and we're supposed to know better and yet we still screw it all up, right? Regardless whether it is because of someone else or our own foolishness, we fail. But thank God, right, that this is not the end. There is still hope. See, at this point, we see a very changed Moses, a very different Moses. This is not the same Moses who who wanted to run away constantly and, and evade every responsibility. Instead of running away this time, Moses pleaded uh, for God's mercy upon these people, right? Moses could have said, I'm too old for this nonsense, right? I'm too old for this nonsense and I quit, but he didn't. Instead, you know, he, he led the people to repent and to consecrate them again towards God. And at this point, I want to tell you that, you know, we are, that you're going to encounter failures and disappointments in life, whether it is because of yourself or someone else. You know, especially if you're in some form of a leadership position, um, you know, people are going to fail you and their, failure are, you know, their failures are going to affect you. And in fact, you know, that, I, I believe that that is the price of, of leadership, of, be, of being appointed a leader, is that the failures of others is going to affect you one way or another, right? The failures of others become your own. And yet, I want to tell you that even though people may fail you, even though you may get disappointed by the failure of other people, by the people you trust, by that you may feel betrayed, just like Moses felt, don't stop pursuing the promises and the purposes of God for you in your life. If God made you, you know, put you in a position of influence over certain people, put certain people under your care, whether it is, it is a ministry, whether it is your own children, whether it is your, your uh, employees, whatever it is, right? If God called you to lead, 
He's going to give you the grace for it. And, and though you may experience a failure and disappointment in leading, you know, don't give up and don't give in, but continue to pursue the promises and the purpose of God uh, for you. Amen. That's lesson number two, right? That we have to deal with all kinds of failures in our lives, including the failures of others, but don't be discouraged, right? Now we're going to fast forward some more to the next and the final uh, events where we will draw our final lesson for today. Now, of course, we know that Moses uh, and the people of Israel overcome uh, eventually, you know, th- that, that uh, setback, you know, uh, and they, they continue to walk with God. And, you know, fast forward many chapters later, uh, we come to the final event and that event is the waters of Kadesh, right? In this part of the story, the children of Israel uh, are in the wilderness of Zin, not sin, sin, okay? Now, the people, uh, this is where we encountered the story where the people had no water and they started complaining. So eventually they, they tell Moses and they said, you know, we have no water. And, and, and Moses and Aaron sought uh, God to, 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 for a solution, right? Now, let's look at, look, look at the story. Num- and uh, It's from Numbers chapter 20, verse 7 to 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod and water came out abundantly and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Now, this is a, this is a not so nice uh, story to read, you know, this is where we, we see uh, Moses and Aaron uh, sought God for a solution. God gave them a solution and said, speak to the rock and water will come out. But what did Moses do? Moses uh, struck the rock instead of, of speaking to the rock. Water did come out. They had, did have water to drink, but it didn't end too well. What happened was because of, because of, of uh, we know that because of Moses' disobedience towards God and he didn't follow God's instruction, um, you know, there was a consequence to it. There was a punishment for it. And, and it's that because of that, he, he was not allowed to enter the promised land. This punishment or, or, or consequence seems a bit harsh, doesn't it? Right? It, it sounds like, man, that, that was... That's a bit of, of a, a very harsh uh, punishment and, and consequence. But if we look here, right, Moses' mistakes were quite significant, weren't they? Right? First, he, he disobeyed a direct command from God to speak to the rock. Instead, he, he, he struck it, right? And we can also see that it seems like he took credit for the miracle itself uh, instead of giving it to God, right? When he said, when he said to the uh, Israelites, he said, must we bring water uh, for you out of this rock? It almost sounded like it was a little bit proud, right? Now, if we read this story as it is and we just stopped here um, and, and this was the end of the story, this would have been a pretty sad story with a pretty sad ending, wouldn't it? Right? After all that Moses had, had been through and, and he couldn't enter the promised land. But you see, though, though God did uh, chastise Moses for the mistake and the disobedience that he made, you know, this wasn't the end of the story. And that's lesson number, th- number three, right? Our failures, our disobedience, our mistakes, they are not the end of the story. Though the consequences of his failure and disobedience meant that Moses couldn't enter the promised land, this was not the end of what God wanted to do in his life. And this was not the end of his relationship with God, right? God still loved Moses. And 
And you know, I said this in, in point number one, in lesson number one, is that we are not defined by our mistakes and, and God doesn't define us by our mistakes. Right here, Moses accepts the chastisement of the Lord and, and his correction. And he continues walking with him. God continues to lead uh, Israel through Moses. He continues to speak to him uh, face to face. In, in fact, you know, uh, the Bible tells us that Moses was one of the people who God spoke face to face as with a friend. Right, um, God still cherished and valued Moses for everything God made him to be. How do I know that? It's very simple. We can simply examine the friendship that he had with God all the way to the end, at the end of his life, even after this incident in the waters of, of Kadesh Meribah. Right? At the very end of Moses' life, right before he dies, uh, and this is in Deuteronomy chapter 34, right? God tells Moses, uh, God tells Moses to go to Mount Nebo and, and God brings him up there uh, and shows him the promised land one last time before he dies. Let's read chapter, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, in the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the western sea, the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zohar. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your own eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his grave to this day. See, God was with Moses till his final breath. Right before Moses died, God brought him on the mountain and showed him the promised land one last time, even though he was not allowed to enter it. Now, do you think God brought him up to rub it in his face and say that, look, you cannot enter this. And do you think God was rubbing it in his face and, and trying to remind him of his mistakes? I absolutely do not think so, right? Because, you see, God enjoyed Moses' friendship so much that Moses got to spend his final breaths with God. I believe God wanted to show him and say, look, this is what you have worked for your whole life. And rest assured, you know, that, you're, that the people of Israel, is, is, they are going to enter into the promised land. God loved Moses so much that the Bible says that God himself buried Moses when he died. And no one else at all, no one else knows where Moses was buried. Don't you think that was special? Don't you think that was absolutely intimate? You know, a millennium and a half later, Jesus, the Son of God, is on top of the mountain and he was being transfigured. His face was shining. Guess who had the honour to be there with the Son of God at that point of time? Talking to him. Two people were with him on that mountain. It was Elijah and Moses. Out of all the people in the Old Testament, right? the great prophets, the kings of the Old Testament, out of all of them, only two people had that honour long after their physical bodies were, were gone, right? And there were two people, Moses and Elijah. Moses was there. Though Moses made, fail, made mistakes in his life, he, though he encountered failures, though he, in, in his own life, in his physical body, he couldn't enter the promised land. He was there. He had the honour of, of being with the Son of God that day when he was transfigured and to fellowship with him over there. Do you think, do you think God honoured, loved, cherished, valued Moses for, he, for who he was as a friend to him? Absolutely. I believe so. Though Moses made mistakes in his life, and encountered failures. Was Moses a failure? Absolutely not. And I've come to an end
for today's message. And, and then I'm just going to summarize the three lessons that we can learn from the failures that Moses encountered in his life, whether by his own or because of other people. It's that number one, we are not defined by our failures. We may encounter failure, we may make mistakes, but we are not defined by them. God will still choose to use us. God will still choose to work in our lives as long as we don't allow ourselves to stop pursuing Him because of our failures. Do not let your failures stop you from pursuing God once again. And number two is that we have to deal with all kinds of failures, including the failures of others and, and, and the effects they have on us. You know, sometimes even when we try our very best, things don't work out because of circumstances, because of the people around us, but don't give up, right? God still is still working. God is still doing something, right? And don't let the failures of yourself or the, of others stop you from pursuing the promises of God in your lives. And lesson number three is that our failures are not the end of the story. Just as, just as Moses' disobedience at, at, at uh, Kadesh Meribah, when he struck the rock, you know, that was his mistake. And yet that wasn't the end of the story. Though he couldn't enter the promised land, right? God still used him tremendously. And he's still regarded as one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. And he still enjoyed a beautiful, rewarding relationship with God. And I want to encourage you, if you have encountered failure in your life, whether by your own mistakes or by someone else or by circumstances, do not let that stop you, right? Let's keep on going. Let's keep on pursuing God's promises and purposes for our lives. Let me pray for you. Father, we just thank you for your word this day. We thank you for your grace and your compassion. We thank you, Lord, that you are not just God over our successes, but you are God over our failures. Nothing, nothing shocks you, nothing scares you. Even, even in the times where, where we, we fail because of our own foolishness, that you, was, you were always there to redeem. You're always there to restore. And you do not see us for our failures, but you see us for who we truly are, who you have truly uh, created us to be. And Father, if there is any disappointment in our hearts because of past failures, if there is anyone who is, who is listening to this message right now and feels defeated and is being haunted by, by the trauma of the past, by the failures that they've committed and, and the, the mistakes of the past, Father, I pray, Lord, won't you release healing right now? Won't you release um, a, a new grace upon their lives, Father God? And Lord, I pray for, for our eyes to shift for our focus, our perspective to shift, that we may know, Lord, that, that you do not define us by our failures, but you have a great uh, a purpose for our lives. And as long as we continue to pursue it, as long as we continue to you, to you, and to turn to you every single time, that even our failures are unable to stop us from fulfilling the call that you have upon our lives. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace upon our lives. Father, we just, we just pray, Lord, for even greater fulfillment of those promises in all our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church, for staying to the end. I hope you have been blessed by the message today. You know, let's continue to persevere and continue to pursue the promises of God in our lives and not let our failures get us down. Amen. Thank you so much. We're going to go into a time of communion. Please get your elements prepared and I'll see you in a while. All right, if you have your communion elements with you, let's come to the Lord's table in a posture of worship this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for the ability to come before you to the table and to commune with you. We thank you, Lord, that, that you made a way on the cross for us. That when you shed your blood on the cross, that you redeem us. You redeem us from all our sins, from all our mistakes and failures, Lord. That we may come to you as your children and that we may be restored completely in you. Father, we thank you for 
the cup that represents your blood that was shed on the cross for the redemption of our sins. We thank you for the bread that represents your body that was broken for us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you bless the elements even as we partake it this morning. Let's take off the bread together. Let's take off the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We receive it in faith this morning and the word that has been released as well. Father, we pray, Lord, that you will continue to lead us daily um, and, and to walk with you daily, just as just as uh, Moses met you face to face and you spoke to him as a friend. Father, we pray, Lord, that we'll have such an intimate, such a rewarding relationship with you daily, face to face, Lord. So, Father, we thank you for, for all that you've done. We pray your richest blessings uh, upon your people in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. And now I pray the blessings of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and abide in you now until forevermore. In Jesus' name, Amen. Stay with us as I roll a few announcements because we have something special for you. Now to connect with us, you can scan the QR code or click on the link provided at the chat box and it will link you to a Google form which you can fill in your inquiry and one of us here from the Cornerstone will connect with you. Now to give to your tithes and offering, you can scan this other QR code here and click on the other link provided at the chat box and it will link you to the bank transfer details where you can make your transfer. This is a special announcement. Next Sunday, we'll be having Pastor Benjamin Chu, who is no stranger among us, and who is well-loved amongst us, bringing us the word. Now, he is the senior pastor of Kingdom Life Community Church in Singapore, and we're very honored to have him here next week. So mark your date, set your alarm, 10 a.m., see you online. And finally, if you're new with us, and if you're a regular, I said it last week, and you haven't followed us on social media, you can do so by following us on our Facebook, our Instagram, or subscribe to our YouTube, or visit us at our website at www.cscborneo.org. Now that's all for the announcements this week. I hope that you've been blessed throughout the service, because I sure have. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week.